Okay, today we're going to talk about microphones and uh, using choice ones for a mobile kit. Throw them in some Pelican cases and off you go. Uh, these particular ones I like to use um, because they're sturdy, they don't break on me, and they have a lot of character within the microphones. Um, I tend to look at microphones as the first phase of EQ, so I don't have to think about EQ on the back end as much. So that's why I choose character-driven microphones over um, a neutral sounding microphone. So to start off, let me just say there's no condenser microphones, as in large condensers. There's a couple of pencils here. But the large condensers I don't bring with me on the road because they tend to break a lot. They're very sensitive. Plus, if you're in humid climates, the capsule will freak out on you, sound pressure, um, things like that. So these mics can usually take a good beating. So we'll start off first with uh, an effect microphone I love from Bing Carbon Audio. It is um, an old carbon microphone replica with some um, capsules from an 80, um, a 1980s telephone. And I like to use this microphone underneath uh, snares or for room sounds or for vocal effects to put delay on it, ble bleed it in on a mix. Um, and there's different kind of EQ adjustments on this button. Next is a Shure 55. This is kind of a standard mic I like to have around. You can use it on anything. Um, sometimes I will use it, there goes a mic. Um, sometimes I'll use it as a room, uh, uh, room tone capturing mic off in the distance because dynamic microphones sound like they're farther in distance than um, uh, a condenser would. <clears throat> but great vocal mic. Next is a broadcasting microphone called an RE20. Very standard across the board. You'll find these in any broadcasting studio. Um, I got turned on to this from singer from, uh, from Radiohead. He likes to record a lot with these, Tom. Um, so I tried it and I loved the sound of the grill. It's got a very grilly sound. So it's really great when I need an up close and personal, intimate, emotional experience sound from my vocalists. I also use this on snares. I also use it on kick drums. I also use it on guitar cabinets. So a lot of these microphones have more than one use. I try to make sure that there's no single purpose in my microphones. They can be used on a lot of different things. The next microphone is a Royer 122. It is, uh, it's cheaper now. They, they, when they first came out, they were pretty expensive, but now they're getting pretty cheap and you can get them for half of what they used to be. Great guitar mic, great overhead mic for drums. Um, and in the right scenario, great vocal mic, depending on the mid-range of your singer. This is a mid-range heavier sounding microphone than most, which is probably why it's so great on guitars. Next is an AEA 84, which is a replica of the RCA 77. Um, great just for room tones. Um, drum overheads. I tend to only do mono overheads um, for drums. It makes it much easier in the mixing process and it doesn't take up too much real estate in the sonic signature of, of the stuff that I'm recording. If I do want to go stereo, I'll start to play with these two together and get some funnier things. Start doing these kind of techniques. Maybe it's that way and that way. Um, just to get a more of an interesting sound out of my drums. Couple last mics are effects mics that I use. This is an old 50 Shure mic. That's a quarter inch plug-in. And it's basically a harmonica mic, like the frequency range of it, but it's a lot warmer. So another mid-range, good for guitars, good for harmonica, things of that nature. And then finally, two pencil condensers. Now I personally hate pencil condensers. They're too pointy and they're too thin sounding, but I like to use these in applications that are unique for effects. So I'll take these and tape these onto my fingers here, or I'll tape them on like this. And I'll move my fingers around, whether it's that like that, and sometimes I've done it like this, um, in front of a sound source to get weird phasing and weird stereo things. And I'll do a hard left right on them, or flip them and, and invert them that way, uh, to get a more unique sound in my background instruments. Uh, keyboards, maybe some pedal steel, stuff that's not filling up the front of the sonic 
picture in my mixes. All these mics I bought used. Um, this is roughly 40, 50 bucks. This was about $10. This was, actually this wasn't used, this was new. He built this for me, it was about $210. These you can pick up used for the same price as a 57. Roughly, if you're in America, it's about 70 bucks. In Canada, about 110. These are a little bit more pricey, but you can get them used for 300-ish. Um, brand new, they're about 500. This Royer brand new, is somewhere between eight hundred and a thousand dollars. You can pick them up used for four or five hundred bucks. And this AEA ribbon new is roughly, I think, about eight or nine hundred bucks, and used the same as the Royer. So I'm somewhere in the four or five hundred dollar range. And if you were doomed to just have one mic for the road, what would you take? What would I take? Doomed one mic. I would probably take this 55. Why? Because you can put it on anything and it'll work. You can get sound out of this. It's a little dull, but um, you can brighten it up on the back end and post. And that's pretty much it for these seven mics. Uh, thanks for joining us today and, and uh, let us know what you think. I learned this trick uh, coming up in the studios in LA, working as a runner, intern, assistant, things of that nature. And what Colin did is brought me in a cord that looks like this, which is a cardinal sin. I probably would have got fired if I did that in L.A. back in the, in, in the 2000s.